welcome to this, the second of the Thornwell Lectures uh, for the summer of 2020. The assignment which is given to me is what is Jesus doing today with training ministers? My calling uh, is to train ministers. My name is Mark Ross. I'm a professor at Erskine Theological Seminary. I have been with Erskine now 16 years. Before that, I was a minister here at the First Presbyterian Church for 20 years as an associate pastor, uh, and now I have been exiled to the seminary, where it is my calling to participate in the training uh, of ministers, using ministers there in the narrow sense, uh, pastors for pulpit ministry, but also of many others, men and women, serving the church in a great variety of ways, some of which we will be talking about as we go along. Again, my question is, what is Jesus doing today with training ministers? And my answer is in three parts. First, he is doing a great many different things. And second, he's doing them in a great many different ways. And thirdly, he is doing them in a great many different places. Uh, as I begin, I'm reminded of how John's gospel ends. John 21, 25. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Well, if that was true when John wrote the gospel, it is certainly true to this day as Jesus continues to do many other things. We'll only be serving, surveying some of them but I believe those that we survey will be enough to show that Jesus is indeed doing a great many different things in a great many different ways and in a great many different places. Let's look first at what is said to us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. This is Paul's great epistle on the church. And when I say the church, I do mean the universal church, the invisible church. Uh, Paul is not addressing in this letter any local concerns, no local issues, no local people are mentioned. Paul is talking about the work of the church universal. And he says in chapter 4 at verse 7, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of, of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Then at verse 11, he tells us what some of those gifts are. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and shepherds, the <clears throat> pastors, shepherds, teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Here Paul tells us that at the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, ascending to the right hand of God, where he is enthroned as King of kings and Lord of lords, he then bestowed gifts upon men. And here he uses the word anthropos. He means upon all his people. We'll be looking in just a minute at Acts chapter 2, where the quotation is made from Joel, the second chapter, that in the last days the Spirit would be poured out. That's what Jesus does when he ascends to the right hand of God. And Paul says he gave gifts to men. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. In 1 Corinthians 12, in Romans chapter 12, he talks about gifts of the Holy Spirit that have been spread across the whole body of Christ. But in this particular chapter, he's mainly looking at those to whom the ministry of the word has been committed. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors or shepherds, and teachers. 
people who will equip the saints for the work of ministry, for it is through the word of God that each person in the body of Christ is equipped for the ministry to which he or she is called. <clears throat> now, how did Christ bestow these gifts upon us when he ascended into heaven? Well, he did not drop these people down out of heaven, fully formed and shaped for the work of ministry to which they were called. He raises up these people by his hand of providence, as well as by the working of his spirit, and calls them to the particular ministries to which he sends them. In the book of Acts, as I mentioned, we read from the prophet Joel in the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on your sons and on your daughters. They shall prophesy on your young men. They shall see visions and your old men. They shall see dreams. They shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. In the church that will be formed by the Lord Jesus Christ through his spirit, every member of the body of Christ is called to a work of ministry. And that will be done in and through those who are called to the ministry of God's word for the equipping of all people. Paul tells us that the word of God has been breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God and it is profitable profitable for our doctrine or our teaching, for reproving us, showing us where we're wrong, for correcting us, not only showing us where we're wrong, but making us right, fitting us, straightening us out, and for training us in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Well, key to the equipping of every member of the body of Christ for the work of ministry is the ministry of those who will administer God's word to his people because it is that word that will equip them together with the spirit of God for the works of ministry to which God is calling them. As Jesus prepares for this new age of his church when the spirit is poured out, he chooses new wineskins for containing the new wine of the gospel which he brings because it is a gospel for all the nations. It is no longer just priests and Levites, the descendants from one tribe in Israel who will serve God in the ministry of his word. Rather, Jesus begins in Galilee and not in Jerusalem. He begins in Galilee, as Matthew explains in his gospel, because it is Galilee of the nations or Galilee of the Gentiles. Though Jesus begins with sons of Israel, descendants from the tribes of Israel, he begins with those who have lived in Galilee. They are living in a multicultural and in a cross-cultural setting. There are many Gentiles in that area, which is why it has the name that it does, Galilee of the Gentiles. And as we'll see, Jesus chooses a very diverse group of people to carry his gospel to the diverse people, the diverse peoples that he is calling to himself in the church. First, he chooses fishermen from Galilee. Peter and Andrew, James and John. In, Josh, in John's gospel, we learned that Andrew had been a disciple of John the Baptist. That is possibly true also of Peter, maybe even of James and John too. They were zealous for the coming of the kingdom of God. Though they were Galilean fishermen, we should not think that they were careless about Jewish laws or regulations. Peter, in Acts chapter 10, after the day of Pentecost, he is given a vision of clean and unclean foods coming down out of heaven in a great sheet. And he is told to kill and to eat. But Peter refuses to do it. He says, Lord, my lips have never touched 
that which is unclean. Though he was a fisherman, though he lived in a territory that was filled with Gentiles, people who practiced uh, <clears throat> things and ate things that Peter would never consider doing, he remained faithful to the Lord's law. He apparently was brought up in a very pious way, observant of the law, though he was a fisherman. But also to be called into this group was a tax collector. A tax collector because he would be dealing with both Greeks, Gentiles, as well as Jews in Galilee of the Gentiles. He would likely have been literate in Greek and Aramaic, perhaps even some Latin, uh, in dealing with the Romans, he was going to be well equipped for writing the gospel that would be committed to his care. Also to be found in that mix of disciples was a man by the name of Simon who is described as a zealot by Luke. He is called a Canaanian in Matthew and Mark, but the word for Canaanian there probably is not to tell us that he was a, a descendant of Canaanites. Uh, rather, it, it's related to the Hebrew word for being a zealot or being a revolutionary. Now, whether Simon had been a political revolutionary or whether he was one who was called a zealot because like Paul, he had been very zealous uh, for the law, that we don't know because nothing else is really told to us about him. But there he was in the midst of the 12. After the day of Pentecost, as Jesus has ascended into heaven, he will choose another notable disciple to carry his gospel. That will be the Apostle Paul. And he will come from the heart of Judaism. He was from a Pharisee family. He was raised according to the law in a very strict way. He had been a student of the chief rabbi of the time, Gamaliel. He had tried to demonstrate that he was more zealous than everybody else. Perhaps he was trying to supplant Nicodemus, who Jesus had described as the teacher of the Jews. Maybe Paul had coveted that place among them. But Paul was also the chief of sinners. That was unknown to him until he came to Christ, until his eyes were opened. But when his eyes had been opened, then he saw that all his religious zeal was really idolatry. It was covetousness. He was coveting high places, though outwardly he looked like a man very devoted to God. Inwardly, he was just a man devoted to himself. He was full of all covetousness and idolatry. And yet he was to become the chief apostle. He was to become uh, the Lord's uh, apostle to the Gentiles uh, to carry uh, his gospel to them. So this is a, a taste of some of the, uh, we might call the first generation uh, of leadership that was given to the church. But as we move on, there are others. Uh, Luke, the physician, he will give us more of the New Testament than any other writer of the New Testament. Uh, he has generally been thought to have been uh, a Gentile on the basis of what Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, uh, where uh, Luke is distinguished uh, from those who had been of the circumcision. But it's not certain uh, that when Paul says of the circumcision there, he is uh, just talking about Jews. There are others who have argued that Luke was a Hellenistic uh, Jew. Uh, certainly, uh, <clears throat> although he's capable of writing impressive Greek, as we see in the prologue to his gospel, most of his gospel in the book of Acts reads like the Old Testament in Greek, and Luke demonstrate he had an excellent knowledge of it. So if he were a Greek, he must have been a Greek proselyte to have had the kind of knowledge of scripture uh, that he had obtained, uh, and possibly uh, he had been a Hellenistic uh, Jew himself. Then there is John Mark. Uh, John Mark uh, is a cousin to Barnabas who had been uh, part of the leadership of the Church of Jerusalem, but Barnabas became the key link uh, to the Apostle Paul, bringing him into acceptance uh, of the church, and Barnabas would be Paul's assistant on the first missionary journey, and John Mark would go with them. You remember, however, 
Mark abandoned them uh, on that first missionary journey, uh, and that created a real problem when it came time for the second missionary journey. For although Barnabas wanted him to go along, Paul would not have it, and they could not agree over the matter. Uh, they finally separated, with Barnabas taking John Mark in one direction, uh, Paul taking Silas and going in another direction. Uh, Paul would pick up Timothy on that second missionary journey, and he would be brought into the ministry. Uh, John Mark would along the way become like a son to Peter and would serve him in Rome and would give us the gospel that we call of Mark. But the early church would tell us that was Peter's teaching that had been given to the church at Rome. And that gospel demonstrates that John Mark was not only fluent uh, in Greek uh, with an understanding uh, of Aramaic and Hebrew, but of Latin also. Uh, he may well have been among those uh, Jews that had uh, settled in North Africa. There's some indication uh, early church uh, fathers tell us that he was a North African. He would later carry the gospel to Africa. He's looked upon as somewhat the patron saint uh, of the uh, African church. Uh, but John Mark would be brought in uh, to the service of the gospel. And by his association with Peter, and later his association with Paul as well, uh, he would become uh, one of the uh, men to bring us uh, the gospel. If we jump across the, the history of the church, just come down to recent days, let me, let me illustrate the way in which the variety of nations uh, have been brought together at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, before I came to the church back in 1984, uh, the previous pastor had been Dr. Hugh McClure, uh, and he was a good uh, old southern boy. But succeeding him came Dr. Connect, uh, northern born from upstate New York, uh, a man who had uh, imbibed, one might say, a great deal of the Puritans uh, <clears throat> and brought that emphasis when he came here uh, to the church. He had also served as a missionary uh, to Iran for four and a half years before he came here. Uh, after he left, uh, Dr. Dick DeWitt would come, and he had come out of the tradition of Dutch uh, Calvinism. He would be succeeded by Sinclair Ferguson, uh, a son of Scotland. And after that would come Derek Thomas, a Welshman, uh, who had married an Irish wife and had served for 17 years in Belfast of Northern Ireland. So this church has tasted of the working of God's providence in raising up ministers from a variety of places in order to bring them into the service of his kingdom and to bring them into the service of his kingdom in this particular place. Jesus is doing a great many different things. In our second section, we want to consider that the Jesus who is doing a great many different things is doing them in a great many different ways, even as we focus just upon the training of ministers. As has already been indicated as we move through the uh, first generation of disciples and even the second generation, the, the primary means of training people for this work of ministry had been what we might call personal discipleship or mentoring. Jesus chose 12 who would be with him. They traveled with him. They listened to him as he taught. He answered their questions when they came to him, especially when he was speaking in parables to the people. Uh, <clears throat> that was not uh, easily understood, and so the disciples would come to him privately and ask him what he meant. And so by being with him, they were learning from him, and he would gradually incorporate them into the work that he was doing. Uh, he commissioned them and sent them out on a short short-term mission, and then they came back and reported to him what had happened as, as they went out to do what they had seen him doing. And, and this continues to be the chief way by which ministers are prepared is they become partners with someone in ministry and are trained by them uh, as they go along with them, as they live with them and serve with them. Uh, Paul had Timothy, Timothy, 
in that particular role. And in the letter to the Philippians, Paul tells us that Timothy had served him like a son, that there was really no one else quite like him uh, who would genuinely be concerned for the welfare uh, of others. Uh, Timothy had the background uh, of a very uh, pious mother and grandmother uh, that helped to form and shape him. When, when Paul came into uh, <clears throat> the region that we would now call the region of the Galatians, where Paul had written uh, his letter, churches founded on the first missionary journey and visited on the second missionary journey, uh, we are told that Timothy was commended to Paul by the men of that place. Uh, the upbringing he had received from his mother and from his grandmother, which Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, they had taught him the sacred writings uh, in which we may be able to come to salvation. He had known those from his childhood. So Timothy had an upbringing in the scriptures, and then he's brought into the ministry alongside the apostle Paul, uh, who takes Timothy with him as Jesus had taken the 12 disciples uh, with him. Uh, and that was the chief method uh, by which uh, people were trained uh, for the ministry, personal and small group uh, discipleship, going along with someone who was more advanced in the ministry. Now, over time, that would become more institutionalized. Uh, <clears throat> the church would uh, begin to uh, educate and train its priests in schools that had been set aside for that. And even at the time of the Reformation, when so much of the way uh, of the Roman Catholic Church of the Middle Ages uh, had been uh, rejected and thrown away. The training of ministers continued under what we might call a, a university or seminary model. Calvin would establish the Genevan Academy. That would later grow into the University of Geneva. Uh, Luther was training his followers uh, at the University of Wittenberg, where Luther was a professor. Uh, and so the, the training of people for the ministry became institutionalized in schools of what we would call uh, higher education or higher learning. When the gospel came into America, well, there was a period where we had to give up on that. Initially, the colonies were dependent upon ministers who had been trained uh, in England or in Scotland or perhaps in, in Europe. Uh, but over time, as more and more settlers came, uh, as there was expansion westward into what was then wilderness, well, then the training of ministers became more complicated because young people growing up might not be able to just pack up and leave and go back to England or Scotland or Ireland or Europe for education. Uh, for Presbyterians, one of the uh, major uh, uh, links to us was the founding of the Long College in Bucks County, uh, Pennsylvania by uh, William Tennant. Uh, that would last for a time as William Tennant and his wife brought students to live in their home, there to be trained uh, by him, much in the manner of Jesus uh, and his disciples, uh, or Paul uh, and Timothy. Uh, but uh, but that would give way uh, over time, and the College of New Jersey would eventually become Princeton uh, Seminary, and once again, uh, ministers would be trained in uh, what today are oftentimes called brick and mortar uh, institutions, uh, where students come to a particular place and devote a certain number of years, typically three years of full-time study in uh, learning uh, the basics uh, of ministry, Greek and Hebrew, uh, Old Testament, New Testament, systematic theology, church history, preaching, pastoral care and counseling, evangelism, etc. Uh, that was standard uh, in my day, though I'd have to say under God's grace and providence, uh, I had uh, the model of personal discipleship alongside uh, institutional uh, learning. Uh, like Timothy, I had had the benefit of a very godly mother uh, 
who saw to it that I went to church, went to church, uh, did my homework assignments for church, that is to say, memorize your uh, weekly verse for Sunday school, take me to vacation Bible school, where again I had to memorize and, and learn Holy Scriptures. When I finally came to faith uh, in college, uh, I was incorporated into a small group discipleship. Uh, Twelve of us uh, were brought together to we uh, meet on a weekly basis uh, for Bible study, for prayer, for Bible memorization, uh, and in being challenged to, to live for Christ. Uh, it was through that group that I discovered my calling uh, to gospel uh, ministry. Uh, <clears throat> I was uh, to go like uh, the Log College and live with the minister uh, who was leading our discipleship group during my junior year. But in the providence of God, he was called away to a different uh, ministry, and instead of just moving into his house and continuing my training under him, I now had to pick up some of his duties uh, in the college ministry while the church continued to search uh, for his replacement, which would take a year. And I and three other men who were part of that uh, house, we carried out different responsibilities uh, in the college ministry for that year. So uh, before I even got to seminary, I had the benefit of this personal mentoring and training uh, in the ministry. And then I would continue to labor in that church as I uh, did my uh, three years of seminary. I say three years, I crammed them into four. Uh, I got married during that time. Children began to come along. Uh, so three years uh, extended into four. Uh, but I was doing then the, uh, the brick and mortar seminary uh, route. But over time, uh, well, the world changed and the way in which the Lord was preparing ministers was changing. Uh, because gradually over time, uh, it became more and more difficult for people who wanted to go into the ministry to just pick up, leave, and go and live uh, near to a seminary. Uh, God was calling people into the ministry at many different ages. Uh, some were entering the ministry in a second career. Uh, <clears throat> when I first went to seminary, most of my classmates were like me, fresh out of college, going on into seminary. But even during the time that I was there, more and more, each new class seemed to have uh, older students coming in, uh, many uh, who had been in careers of uh, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years before they entered uh, the ministry. And as the world changed, as economies changed, as the demographics uh, uh, of seminary uh, changed, uh, <clears throat> seminaries themselves had to change. And seminaries began to develop extension sites that, that moved the education into other cities uh, and towns nearer to where uh, other students were living. Distance education uh, came into vogue. Uh, when I uh, began at Erskine uh, Seminary 16 years ago as a part of our distance education program, which at that time uh, was just uh, recording lectures on cassette tapes, mailing them to students uh, with a certain reading assignments and other things uh, like that to go along. We had students in the south of Sudan in Africa listening to cassette tapes on solar-powered cassette tape players. Uh, today, of course, uh, seminaries uh, have <clears throat> very sophisticated uh, distance education programs, online classes, uh, uh, sometimes in live streaming, sometimes recorded uh, lectures and so on, uh, it is gone. Reformed Theological Seminary, uh, with which this church has had a long association, uh, has a virtual uh, campus that's been operating for many years. Uh, Erskine Theological Seminary, where I serve, uh, has had distance education uh, for many years. Uh, the Liberty University has a massive worldwide uh, online education uh, program. So uh, this has made it possible to extend theological education to people who were unable to move or leave jobs, homes, and uh, <clears throat> even church uh, work to go off and just devote themselves to study in a brick and mortar institution. Uh, 
Uh, it has made it possible to uh, reach students where they are. The other thing that is very good about this is that it keeps people in the communities of faith where they have been called to ministry. Uh, so they continue in those churches, uh, hearing the same preaching that ha they had been preaching, under which they had been called to ministry, uh, serving among the people that they are there. Uh, ministry just can't be learned uh, within the walls of a classroom. It's learned as it's lived out in the life of people in the church. So God was calling a more diverse group of people into the ministry. Uh, whereas degree programs used to focus just on uh, preparing men to step into the pulpit, now there are many different degree programs. There are men and women coming to seminaries preparing uh, for careers beyond the pulpit. Uh, it could be in Christian education, maybe in youth ministry or children's ministry, maybe in Christian counseling, uh, chaplaincy work uh, of various sorts. Seminaries have expanded their degree program offerings to serve the diverse callings that are arising in our churches. Uh, and so uh, the Lord is doing uh, many different things in many different ways. Thirdly, he is also doing them in a great many different places. <clears throat> uh, this church here has a long history of connection uh, to seminary education. Uh, the old Columbia uh, Seminary uh, was here in town uh, from about 1830 uh, to the late 1920s when it moved back to Georgia where it uh, had begun in a kind of law college style. Uh, but our church has had very close connection with Westminster Theological Seminary. Dr. Sinclair Ferguson uh, was a professor with Westminster when he first came here. Uh, RTS Seminary, uh, I have served there. Dr. Thomas uh, serves there. Dr. Ferguson serves there uh, now. Dr. Flora uh, serves there. The interns that are making uh, it possible for us to have these recorded lectures uh, are students there. We've also <clears throat> had a long connection with Erskine. When we began the, uh, the seminary here in 2004, I was asked to come on board to be the first resident professor here. So our church has had a long association uh, with seminary education in this uh, city, but we've also been associated uh, with seminary or ministerial training programs in many other places uh, in the world. Uh, ARPs have had a long association with the work of God in Mexico. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, ages ago, we began to send work teams down into Mexico to help build the Ebenezer Seminary uh, in the city of Tampico. It was through that that we came into association with Andy Toth, who had come into the ARP church, was now serving us as field director uh, for the Mexican work. Uh, and he saw that seminary in Tampico, which had been started by the ARP church in Mexico, but it was kind of weak and floundering at the time. Uh, he had a vision for seeing that work uh, built up. Uh, and so he began to recruit people from the states to come down and assist uh, in work projects. Uh, we would eventually send Scott Moore out of our congregation to go as a professor to that place. Judy Deduchin, who was active in our music program here, played for our evening service, uh, served <clears throat> uh, in instruction uh, with choirs and so on. Uh, Judy uh, went down there uh, on one of our work crews and she had a call uh, to the work and so she prepared and went to the mission field uh, for a time there. So we've had association with work in Mexico. Um, our chancel choir has been supporting the work of the African Reformation Theological Seminary uh, in Africa. We have sent medical teams there uh, under the leadership of Dr. Frank Hill and Paula uh, <clears throat> and others who have been uh, a part of that. Uh, in the ARP Church, we began what we call the Mobile Theological Training Team. Uh, we have supported John and Sarah Ella uh, Carson and the Galettas, who are uh, still uh, working in that uh, 
are associated with our church. We supported Scott and Victoria Andes who had come out of our congregation. Uh, and though they've served in a number of places, one of uh, the places they served was in Ukraine where Scott was a part of a seminary uh, preparing ministers there. Uh, Ed and Maxine Gross in our congregation serve with Global Training Network and they are working in China and in various places in Africa uh, for building up leadership in churches. Uh, Miriam Jerome in our congregation is assisting women uh, who are serving in various ministry capacities uh, across uh, the globe. Uh, Doug and Aline Kroc in our midst. Uh, uh, Doug has been making trips to Cuba regularly uh, over the last many years, helping to grow uh, a church in Cuba and to prepare leaderships uh, for uh, the future church in, in Cuba. Paul and Brenda Pepin, who came out of our church, uh, uh, and served uh, more recently here in Columbia, pastoring, pastoring at uh, Crossroads uh, Community Church. Paul has now retired from that ministry uh, and is serving uh, as a cooperative minister with uh, World Witness and helping to do leadership training in India, in Pakistan, and also in Cuba. Uh, we've had association with Wycliffe Bible Translators uh, over a long period of time, currently supporting the Conroys, the Lynns, the Berthumes, Berthumes are uh, related to the Toths. Uh, Andy and Dorsion's daughter married Scott Berthume. Uh, they worked among the Northern Pame people in Mexico, translating uh, the scriptures into Pame, and Scott uh, is now uh, a dean uh, in uh, working in Bible translation uh, in a school in uh, Texas. Uh, <clears throat> these are some of the many different ways in which we've been a part of equipping and preparing pastors in, in many different places. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to wrap this up by just returning back to Andy uh, and Dorsion uh, Toth uh, and commending to you uh, a video that you can find online uh, that was done a couple of years ago uh, <clears throat> that told the story uh, of a particular work uh, that uh, the Toths had been a part of, uh, a work that had its beginning back when they first began uh, to serve uh, in Mexico long ago, uh, and then suffered a 28-year interruption before there was a reconnection with the work in that place, that place being the High Sierra down in the uh, area of uh, Acapulco, uh, Guerrero, uh, <clears throat> uh, back in the mountains though, not uh, in the city of Acapulco, but way back in a remote region. Uh, Andy and Dorsion had uh, begun ministry in that place uh, long ago, and they labored uh, in a place that was very, very hard. Uh, there was uh, very little interest uh, in the gospel, though, though they were laboring in a place that had formerly uh, been served by Presbyterian missions, and though there were many people that would have identified themselves as Presbyterian, uh, there was almost nothing of Christianity to be found in that place. Uh, and they began to labor there, and it was a, a difficult uh, slog. And then the Holy Spirit broke in in a marvelous way. It, it involved a story, and I commend this uh, video to you. you uh, find it uh, on Vimeo, uh, Finishing Well, the ministry of Andrew and Dorsion Toth. Uh, just plug it into your search engine and, and pull it up. Uh, uh, a young girl uh, was injured, having fallen on a fence post, and God did a miraculous work of healing her. Uh, her father went out into the villages telling everyone what God had done, uh, and it sparked a revival in that place. The, uh, the work began to grow, the churches began to fill. Um, but over time, God the Holy Spirit began to do some things there that made some of the Presbyterian hierarchy a bit uncomfortable with what was going on down there. And it actually led uh, to that Presbyterian uh, board uh, removing them from that work and assigning them elsewhere. And so their, their ties with that region was broken and. Uh, under the providence of God, like 
like the Apostle Paul had been prevented at one point from going into Asia or going into Bithynia, uh, they were prevented from going back to the High Sierra. They continued to serve Lord. They were productive and fruitful in many other ways. For 17 years, they served our denomination uh, as uh, field directors. Um, but they were eventually led uh, to leave the work of being a missionary in Mexico to found a mission sending agency from Mexico. In other words, they had served as a missionary from America to Mexico. They were now seeking to help Mexicans form their own mission board to be sending missionaries elsewhere. And that led them into association uh, eventually with World Indigenous Ministries. And in the course of following that out, Andy ended up back down near where they had once served. And he went back into that territory. And he decided to go up and to see just, just what was there after 28 years. And when he came into that town, uh, he was walking down the street, and a, and a young man saw him, and he said, Are you Hermano Andres? Uh, are you the man Andrew? The missionary, the pastor. Yes. I am, and he, he was a young boy that had been touched by that ministry. He was now the pastor of the church. And with that reconnection and the thoughts, eventually they began to see that there was a need for trained pastors in that territory, for trained Christian workers. And eventually a school was born, a Bible training school to equip pastors for churches, to equip women for ministry uh, in the area among uh, women in Bible studies in, in other ways. It took them six years to graduate their first class. Many of their first students first needed to finish high school and, and then to get some college level training and, and then to get the specialized training. So a program they had hoped might be three years turned into six years. But in 2018, they graduated 13 students. And they have 17 in the incoming class right now. It's a marvelous story. It's, it's just one among perhaps thousands or tens of thousands or more stories that could be told of how Christ is doing many different things in many different ways and in many different places. Let's come back as we close to, to think about the work of God in our place. We're serving in a time in which there's great division in the land in which we serve. There, there's political division between Republicans and Democrats. There's, there's racial division between blacks and whites, Hispanics, Asians. And there's lots of difficulty in the world. There is a work in the world that is capable of overcoming all the things that divide people in a society. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we are reconciled to him, he brings us into a family and makes it possible for us to live in reconciliation with the others that God has reconciled to himself. He brings together a church. He, he took those Galilean fishermen and he creates a new church and he, he grows it so that Jew and Gentile come together as one. We began our time in the book of Ephesians and in that great letter that speaks of the church, its great theme is the union of Jew and Gentile brought together to be one body of Jesus Christ. They are to be the dwelling place of God in the Holy Spirit. This is the way by which there can be unity among people, where there can be common love, brotherhood across the bounds that separate the rest of the world. And we are then positioned to be peacemakers in our society because we have known peace with God and we can live at peace with one another. And we can go out into this broken world and bring others into that same peace that we have known in Jesus Christ. Jew and Gentile, black, white, Hispanic, 
Asian, people from all over the world can be united in Jesus Christ. That's the grand level of it all. Let, let's bring it down to interpersonal relationship as well. The, the New Testament gives us a beautiful example of this very thing. While Paul was in Ephesus, uh, for three years he was able to conduct daily teaching and and Luke tells us that all Asia heard the word of God during that time. Oh, one of the things that happened was a man by the name of Epaphras had, had come to faith in Jesus Christ and he carried the gospel eastward out of Ephesus into the Lycus Valley and founded churches in Colossae and Hierapolis. There was a man out there by the name of Philemon. He probably also had met Paul in Ephesus uh, because Although Paul had not been to Colossae at the time he writes the letter, they hadn't seen his face, yet there's a letter written to Philemon at that same time, and it's evident that Paul and Philemon uh, have known each other intimately. Paul has very effusive love to express to this man, not only for what he's meant to the church, but for what he's meant to Paul personally. Paul had led him to Christ. Paul says, you owe me your very life. But in the providence of God, while Paul was in prison at Rome or under house arrest awaiting trial, he had also led another man to Christ, a man by the name of Onesimus. And how unbelievable is the working of God, Onesimus had been a slave in the house of Philemon. Onesimus had apparently run away, and, and when he did, perhaps he had stolen some things when he did. But now Onesimus had come to Jesus Christ. And when Paul writes his letter to the Colossians, he writes also a letter to Philemon, and he sends Onesimus back. Onesimus had become very helpful to Paul. His name means useful, and Paul said he lived up to it. He, he had become useful to Paul. Paul would have loved to have kept him in the work of ministry. But Paul did not want to do it without permission from Philemon, nor apparently did he want to do it while they remained unreconciled to one another. So Paul writes a letter to Philemon, and he puts it in the hand of Onesimus. And together with Tychicus, who had taken the letter to Colossae, they went back. And Paul calls for reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus, to receive him back now, not as a slave, but as a brother in Jesus Christ. Well, we don't know exactly how all of that went, but what evidence we do have seems to suggest it must have gone very well. It's possible Onesimus was indeed returned to Paul for service. I say that because uh, just after the apostolic letter, we have evidence from Ignatius who writes, of a bishop who had succeeded Timothy in the supervision of the church at Ephesus. That bishop's name was Onesimus. And in the letter that Ignatius writes where we get this information, there are echoes in that letter of Paul's letter to Philemon. He doesn't come right out and say this is the same man, but it certainly makes it very, very likely. Oh, what a beautiful picture that is. Master and slave, now reunited as brothers in Jesus Christ. The gospel can unite Jew and Gentile. It can unite black and white. It can unite people from the many nations that are separated by politics and economics and all kinds of reasons that lead them hostile and antagonistic towards one another, all of that can be broken down in the gospel. And we can be made one in Jesus Christ. And ministers can play a key role in that. Because as ministers, studying together for the gospel, learn to trust and love one another, they can lead their congregations into partnerships with others. And we can become a united body of Christ working in our communities, working in partnerships in our nation, or in worldwide efforts to show that Jesus Christ can heal the divisions in our souls and in our lives, in our churches, and in our world.
Well, may God, the Holy Spirit, equip us for these days. Let's pray together. Our God and our Heavenly Father, how we pray that you will indeed unite us in the work of ministry, that you will help us to be at peace with you and with one another for the sake of the gospel, so that in our unity the world might see that we are truly your disciples, that the world might know that you have come into the world because the Father loved us and that you have loved us even as you loved the Son, O great God in heaven. Oh, how we pray that you will make us a force for good in our world, that the church of Jesus Christ may be built up, that its witness may be extended, and that glory may come at last to your name. We ask it through Christ our Savior. Amen.